بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أصحاب المعالي والسعادة Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, peace be upon you. It is a pleasure to welcome all of you at the Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and Research at this specialized conference entitled Climate Change and the Future of Water, which is organized by the Emirates Center in collaboration with the University of Maine from United States. We will start this conference by welcoming remarks of Dr. Jamal al Suwedi, Director General of the Center, and I'm going to deliver the speech on his behalf. In the name of Allah, the most compassionate, the most graceful, excellencies, the audience, first of all, I am delighted to convey to you the wishes of His Highness uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, Deputy Commander of Armed Forces and President of the Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and Research, and his wishes of success for you and for this conference. I would like also to express the gratitude of Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and Research to organize uh, this uh, conference in collaboration with the University of Maine. And the conference is tackling one of uh, the important issues uh, for uh, all countries of the world, uh, given the the relationship uh, between this issue and the many other issues, such as security and uh, water. And this conference, uh, with all the speeches and discussions that will come up uh, during these two days, uh, will have an important output uh, for further discussions of this issue and to come up uh, with a strategy that will help us to deal with this issue in more efficient ways. Excellencies, dear audience, the topic of our audience today addresses one of uh, the most dangerous challenges all of the world is facing, uh, not only what uh, some places are facing in terms of uh, greenhouse uh, effects, desertification, uh, pollution of the environment, uh, in addition to lack of uh, water sources uh, due to the huge demand on water, but also uh, given the dangerous uh, effects of that. And if the International Bank has recently warned of uh, the significant impacts uh, climate change could have on water scarcity, especially in the Middle East, and the, the effects that could have uh, on development in many countries of the Asian, there is no doubt that it will go beyond that in the future because the water scarcity and the huge demand and the pressure on water and the increase in population in the in the region uh, could uh, trigger uh, conflicts in the region about water and this imposes on us the need uh, to find efficient solutions uh, to deal uh, with these challenges uh, and to contain uh, the effects in the future Excellencies, uh, their audience, we in United Arab Emirates and in the GCC countries in general, we attach uh, exceptional uh, importance to issues on, of environment and climate change and water future because, as you know, uh, no uh, single country can uh, continue on its part of development uh, without being able to achieve water security and to preserve its environment, especially in our region, uh, which has uh, a significant uh, uh, scarcity of water. And these are uh, factors that uh, constitute a pressure on our water resources and necessitate uh, a good management of uh, water. 
His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, uh, Deputy Commander of Ahmed Forces of the UAE, has expressed clearly uh, the problem of water that the UAE and the GCC countries are facing when he highlighted in 2011 that water uh, constitutes or has an, an importance uh, that goes beyond uh, what we think uh, and that uh, the Arabic Peninsula is facing a big problem because if we can obtain water through desalination, it will change. The situation is going to change in the future because we have no rivers in the region and no techniques to obtain fresh water. So His Highness has uh, urged uh, for further studies, uh, studies and research and to set up uh, solutions uh, to find the uh, possibilities of uh, meeting demands of the future and to preserve uh, natural resources uh, for us and the fu for future generation. And uh, he suggested uh, organizing uh, organizing an annual summit uh, in Abu Dhabi in which uh, policy makers and experts uh, in water from all over the world would participate to find, to find out solutions related to fresh water. This shows the outstanding importance that the UAE attaches to this uh, issue and uh, its interest in finding comprehensive and sustainable solutions to these issues. The good management uh, of water resources is one of the main needs uh, for uh, water management and uh, for preservation of environment from uh, future uh, changes. And the, the UAE is aware of that and is implementing it through its uh, water plans. The vision of the UAE aims uh, to enhance uh, uh, water management and to preserve uh, its water resources and achieve the sustainability excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. The expertise uh, of uh, the last years uh, has uh, shown that uh, the water management uh, and climate change have become uh, one of the priorities of the world uh, for facing the challenges uh, related to them. To this effect, I am confident that uh, our conference uh, is going uh, to uh, boost uh, those efforts to the solutions that will come up during this conference, which will allow the policymakers to build uh, strategies and solutions uh, that will be comprehensive uh, and uh, will take uh, into uh, consideration the challenges uh, of climate change and how to deal with them. Uh, I wish you success and uh, may God uh, help you to achieve your goals. Uh, peace be upon you. Well, on. Now I am pleased to invite uh, uh, His uh, Excellency Dr. Ashid Ahmad bin Fahed, Minister of Environment of Water, uh, to give his speech. Please come to the floor. Peace be upon you, uh, Excellency Dr. Jamal uh, Sanad Al Suwedi, uh, Director General of Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and Research, Excellencies, the diplomats, their guests, peace be upon you. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome you and to express my uh, happy, happiness uh, for having you here uh, to participate in this conference uh, organized by uh, Emirates Center uh, for Strategic Studies uh, and Research in collaboration uh, with the University, the American University, Maine. Uh, uh, this conference uh, will uh, mobilize uh, worldwide expertise uh, to set up the stage uh, for further this 
discussion about issues uh, of priority, there is no doubt that uh, choosing this center uh, for relationship between uh, climate change and water uh, has a lot of importance uh, given the relationship between the issues of water with development, health, and energy, uh, uh, food security, biodiversity. Ladies and gentlemen, the water resources uh, worldwide uh, have witnessed uh, a huge uh, depletion in the last decades because of the increase in population uh, and uh, economic growth and change in uh, consumption, consumption trends and inefficient use of water in agriculture and urban and industrial uh, area. And this uh, has uh, increased, uh, has uh, led uh, to uh, recovery in uh, water to more than three times from what it was during uh, five decades ago. And we expect this depletion uh, to uh, go further in the, near, in the future decades, uh, uh, given the increasing pressure if we continue on this end. And regardless of some uh, uncertainties, there is especially uh, related to change uh, to climate change that still exists, uh, we see that it is certain that climate change uh, predicted uh, for the future will, pl will play an important role in increasing pressure uh, on our water resources in many areas. Uh, is, even though the climate change has uh, some positive effects that uh, consist in increasing the average of rivers flow and the availability of water uh, in uh, latitude uh, and uh, some tropical areas, there are negative effects, and the negative effects uh, they are higher. Uh, such as uh, and, and it will not be only about uh, some uh, the, some region in uh, latitude uh, but will go beyond that it will uh, many many the islands uh, will suffer also a lack of uh, water sources the effects uh, will not uh, be uh, only on water resources, but uh, will also affect uh, many uh, kinds of uh, water pollution and uh, uh, acidification uh, of uh, oceans and uh, also effects uh, on systems and other sectors. Ladies and gentlemen, United uh, uh, Arab uh, Emirates uh, is uh, uh, situated uh, in the belt of the high areas, uh, which uh, suffer uh, high degrees of temperature and lack of precipitation. And the climate change uh, uh, is adding uh, more pressure on our country. In uh, dealing with this uh, pressure, the UAE has followed uh, a multi-approach uh, which uh, relies uh, on comprehensive management of water resources and uh, being aware of the sensitivity of uh, water resources, uh, UAE has uh, in the last years increased its efforts uh, to preserve those, uh, those sources, uh, taking into account uh, uh, its compatibility with the uh, environment criteria and the mitigation of climate change. It has, it has started desalination of water, enhancing efficient use of water in, in agriculture, and uh, or managing uh, digging wells, underwater wells, uh, and has expanded in building dams, uh, and uh, has also worked on managing uh, consumption trends in order to achieve uh, uh, an, an acceptable average of water consumption uh, in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, 
probably the issue of climate change uh, did not uh, get uh, enough uh, importance uh, until the last time. And maybe the reason for that is because the stakeholders uh, were dealing uh, with more important challenges, but it seems that the effects of uh, climate change uh, uh, were uh, not were not enough, uh, and, it, and it seemed that effects of climate change uh, uh, were uh, less than what uh, were more than we predicted. And uh, also, the compatibility with climate change uh, did not get uh, enough uh, efforts uh, from, uh, uh, from the world. And uh, we uh, highlight uh, the need to attach more importance uh, uh, for issues uh, of uh, uh, compatibility, uh, which we should uh, include in all our plans and strategies related uh, to water resources, uh, especially uh, that uh, especially that it using the, the emissions uh, that uh, will guarantee uh, success of the scenarios of two Celsius will not uh, appear before, two, before uh, decades to come. At the moment, uh, it is, at the same time, it is important to focus uh, on developing uh, networks of control and to enhance the uh, efficiency and to enhance also uh, research and studies related to climate change, uh, knowing that climate change uh, refutes the traditional assumption which says that uh, uh, hydrological expertise uh, uh, give a guide, a good guide uh, for uh, the future, according uh, to uh, a statement from the government agency interested in climate change. And uh, I would like at this point uh, to highlight uh, my appreciation of uh, the participation of uh, highly acclaimed researchers in the issues of water from the United States and from the United Arab Emirates. There is no doubt that the sector of agriculture um, must be on the top of our priorities. Uh, the agriculture uh, sector uh, undergoes uh, more effects uh, in case of uh, water resources. So uh, any change uh, in uh, in precipitations uh, would have uh, significant effects uh, on agriculture sector and on food security. Uh, hence, uh, we must uh, look at this issue seriously and we should uh, apply uh, technical uh, choices and the best practices uh, and adopt agriculture trends that uh, would uh, need less consumption of water and have uh, uh, crops uh, that uh, would be uh, capable to adapt uh, with the, the, the raising temperature. And we should also uh, support the activities of research and the innovation. Another sector that needs our interest is the sector of desalination. Uh, desalination. Desalinated water is an important source for many countries in the world, uh, especially the GCC countries, uh, uh, which uh, need, which has uh, more than uh, half of the world. Uh, sources of desalinated water, especially in the in the, the islands. Uh, given the effects uh, between desalination and the environment uh, and climate change, it is important uh, to work on developing environmental criteria and to adapt uh, the suitable techniques. Uh, and I would like to highlight here that the UAE has already uh, urged during a discussion panel uh, organized in, Uni in United Nations in New York uh, in the last year has called uh, for sustainability of uh, water desalination and uh, has uh, called uh, for uh, supporting uh, development of uh, desalination techniques uh, and uh, renewable energies. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the UAE has announced earlier its commitment to, to the goals, to the goals of international community in United Nations in the in the framework uh, agreement of United Nations uh, related to climate change and Kyoto Protocol and the uh, conferences of uh, participating countries. And this uh, has been also mentioned uh, clearly in the vision of the UAE, the vision 2021. It is uh, a nation vision uh, aiming uh, to achieve uh, the goals of the UAE to become uh, one of the best countries of the world by the year 2021. The UAE has followed uh, many uh, choices, uh, such as uh, the clean energy, the green economy, the green architecture, the sustainable transportation, the green applications. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, at the end of my speech, I would like to say uh, that uh, the future of water is facing many dangers. It depends on our choices, especially uh, the choice of adaptation. And, uh, we have many uh, choices uh, and innovative choices that uh, the, the conference uh, will highlight and which could uh, help uh, in, in uh, tackling the issues uh, of climate change. When uh, we are urging again to attach more importance to issues and mechanism of funding of and of technology uh, and of building capabilities uh, according to what it was issued uh, during the plan or Bali plan and the fund and the funds of adaptation uh, with climate change. And uh, we, we highlight the principle of uh, joint responsibility. And the UAE uh, had uh, the honor to uh, participate uh, in climate uh, summit, uh, which was organized in New York last month. And it, uh, it was a uh, start for us uh, for an international collaboration in the field of climate change and how to handle its effects. And uh, we hope that uh, this conference uh, today uh, will uh, be a trigger uh, for what has already started uh, in, uh, in the climate summit in New York uh, to uh, come up uh, with uh, better solutions for the issue of uh, adaptation uh, of uh, water sources with climate change. Uh, thank you very much uh, for listening uh, to my speech, and I thank also the Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and Research. Thank you, and thank you to uh, Dr. Jamal Sanad al Suwidi, Director of the Center. Thank you, Dr. Ashid. Uh, now we'll have the uh, speech of Dr. Azan Khalifa Mubarak, Secretary General of Environment Agency Abu Dhabi. It will be delivered by His Excellency Saeed Al Jabi, who will lead the speech on his behalf. Peace be upon you, Excellency Dr. Ashid bin Fahd, the Minister of Water Environment, Excellency Dr. Jamal Sanad al Suwedi, Director General of Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and Research, Excellencies, their audience, according to the plan uh, or the program of United Nations, uh, the water scarcity has effects uh, on more than 40% uh, of the population. By the year 2020, 1 billion and 800 million persons in the world uh, will suffer from water scarcity given the pressure on water. And we see that clearly in the 
Arab Asian. Eight counties, uh, which are members of the Arab League, are considered the poorest counties uh, in the world, given the high expenses uh, for water. Do you? In Abu Dhabi, we have three sources for water. We have ground water, which constitutes 65% of our supplies, and we have desalinated water, which is the main source of fresh water. It constitutes 30%. And then we have recycled water, which constitute uh, five percent. And uh, even though they are, imp even though groundwater are important, uh, they cannot be uh, in use. And shipping uh, them uh, constitute uh, five percent in areas. Uh, uh, of agriculture, groundwater is decreasing by five meters every year. Our use of groundwater also is increasing on uh, the usage. Uh, and if we continue on this uh, uh, way, uh, we will have less groundwater. We have also a uh, high consumption uh, uh, of, of desalinated water. So we should manage our consumption of desalinated water, and we started implementing many, uh, many solutions and uh, many buildings that uh, we build now. We have uh, a system called sustainability. And uh, the benefits uh, of this system is that it does not only decrease consumption of water, but it also decreases the consumption of energy, uh, which has also effect uh, on decreasing uh, greenhouse effect regarding the external activities. Uh, we do some activities of uh, education and awareness uh, of people working in agriculture, and uh, we adopt uh, some developed technique uh, of irrigation, uh, which makes that we need less water, and uh, we make sure to have uh, efficient uh, infrastructure to use recycled water instead of groundwater for irrigation of farms, the outcome, uh, this will uh, be for three years uh, and will also contribute to preserve the environment. Uh, these measures uh, will help us in some time, but uh, at the long term, uh, we should have water and not only demand of water. This means to decrease our consumption of water and to strike a balance uh, between different sectors, taking into consideration the relationship between water, energy, and security. And there must be difficult uh, decision to make. But it seems important to today that we must take such decision, especially that we are now still at the planning stage and we can make uh, applicable uh, solutions. I would like to uh, move to the issue on uh, climate change and uh, some uh, effects uh, of uh, water consumption. We consume uh, a lot uh, of energy to produce uh, water by using uh, in fact, our consumption of uh, energy and uh, water are the main sources of the in-house effects, which makes it 65 percent of emissions. To decrease uh, this carbonic, uh, uh, this carbonic paints, uh, we aim uh, by the year 2020 uh, to produce 30 percent of energy to clean uh, sources uh, such as nuclear energy and renewable energy. In 2012, we started the uh, desalination program by uh, using renewable energy, which aims to uh, produce uh, innovative uh, energies uh, to decrease demand uh, on energy and to make sure it works uh, with other sources uh, of renewable energy. Uh, we, and we have, it will also help to decrease uh, the emissions uh, and uh, will help to uh, 
give the solutions that can be applied in other areas in the world. This will be an asset for building a competitive economy in the country, uh, uh, an economy based on knowledge and expertise that can be used uh, for the future generations. We still have the, the problems uh, uh, of the minerals uh, that are again pumped in the in the ocean, and this makes the, the water salty again. And this issue can be applied uh, at the level of our operation. It is possible that our natural sources would be affected by climate change, and the sea level rise uh, could lead to pollution of uh, our groundwater and, will, and uh, our co-op uh, sources, uh, our co-op uh, and uh, animals uh, would be uh, threatened. Uh, also, there is uh, the problem uh, with the evaporation uh, and uh, it can affect uh, our sources uh, of uh, water. Uh, but uh, the, the quantity of water that uh, we get uh, and that help uh, in uh, pumping water in groundwater is an important uh, source for us. Uh, Abu Dhabi will be affected by any changes in temperature and uh, quantity of precipitations uh, that can affect other areas in the world. Uh, at the moment, uh, we import 85 to 90 percent of our food. Uh, uh, the more uh, we, the more we have uh, uh, better solutions for dealing with climate change, the more we can uh, uh, deal uh, with our sources. I will go back to uh, an issue that was raised by uh, His Excellency the Minister, uh, which was uncertainty. As you can see also, I was using words such as uh, possible and maybe. This means also uncertainty, because we don't know details of climate change on us in the future. Uh, but uncertainty does not mean that uh, we should not do anything. Uh, on the contrary, we should do our best uh, to mitigate effects uh, of climate change, and we should start from now to be ready uh, for adaptation with climate change. As uh, our authority and, uh, in Abu Dhabi uh, has uh, has implemented uh, many studies and research trying to understand the predicted effects uh, of uh, climate change uh, at the regional uh, and international level. And the more we can uh, focus on these issues, the better it is. And there are no issues import more important than climate change and water. This is why I'm very happy to see uh, many uh, leading experts today meeting here in Abu Dhabi at this conference. And I look forward to hear your recommendation and solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency Dr. Jabir al jabri Now we will take a break for 15 minutes. After that, we will start uh, the first uh, session of uh, the, uh, the conference. Good morning. On behalf of the University of Maine, we are honored and pleased to be here in Abu Dhabi. The University of Maine, and in particular, the School of Policy and International Affairs, is made stronger through its relationship with the Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and Research. I would especially like to thank Dr. Jamal al Sawedi and his vision for convening this meeting around this very important topic. I'm pleased to be moderating this panel on sustainable water policies and climate change. In this panel, we'll be providing a regional perspective regarding sustainable water supply in Abu Dhabi. In addition, we'll be discussing policy and engineering strategies to address the water crisis. Our first speaker this morning is Dr. Mohammed 
Dawood. Dr. Dawood is a water resource advisor with the environmental agency Abu Dhabi a UAE. He, is a, he graduated in civil engineering with honors and got his master's and PhD from Ain Shams University through a joint program with Colorado State University in the United States. Since 1991, he has maintained an active program of research and consulting activities with particular emphasis on groundwater, artificial recharge, reuse of TSE, desalination, and water resources management. He attended many training courses in the United States, the Netherlands, Sweden, Spain, and France. He worked as a consultant for World Bank, UNESCO, ESCWA, and USAID. His current research includes water supply and demand, solar desalination, groundwater management, aquifer storage and recovery, and reuse of TSE in many countries such as Egypt, Nigeria, Kenya, Mali, Oman, KSA, and UAE. He's an editor of three international journals and a reviewer for seven others. He has published five books and more than 75 published research papers in international peer-reviewed journals and international conferences. In 2009, he received the Abu Dhabi Excellence Award, and in 2011, um, the, the Sheikh Sultan bin Zayed Al Nayan Award. In 2011, he was awarded by the National Academies in the United States as one of the best four young Arab water scientists. This morning, he will be speaking on strategies for sustainable water management in Abu Dhabi Emirates. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, uh, for the uh, Emirates Center for Strategic Research and Maine University for inviting me to be participating in this uh, very interesting event. And I would like to thank our distinguished guest and our participant today. Actually, water research has started to uh, gain a lot of concerns and a lot of attention, not only in the area which we are living the arid region, but also even in the uh, countries which is, you do have a lot of water and you have excess water resources, freshwater resources, not because of the quality, the quantity, but because of the quality. So uh, there is a lot of attention now regarding the water all over the world. Of course, the situation is a little bit worse in the arid region, such GCC and Abu Dhabi Emirates and United Arab Emirates in specific because we have a very limited scarce water resources. We have very limited renewable water resources compared with the worldwide standards. All over the world, they consider that if you are below 500 cubic meter of water, they can consider you as suffering from the water stress or water poverty. In Abu Dhabi Emirates or the United Arab Emirates, we are speaking about less than 100 cubic meter per capita renewable water resources a year, which means that we are suffering from the water stress. Actually, or historically, our grandfather were using our limited resources very uh, uh, sustainably by a system what we called it sometimes a flag or fallacy system. The fallacy system that they can withdraw the groundwater without bumping by gravity, and then they can use it for cultivation and irrigation of oases, uh, which is, uh, uh, exists in some northern Emirates and also in Abu Dhabi and Al-Ain area. We do have some oases which is still exist at the uh, present. But with the development which have been started in the middle of the seconds after the discovering of the oil, a huge or rapid increase in different people in the population sector, in different economic development sectors like industrial sector, agricultural sector, forestry sector, and even greening sector, this development or this rapid development put a lot of pressure on this scarce water resources and the available resources. And we have to find a lot of resources or to bump and exhaust our non-renewable groundwater aquifer to supply the demand center with the enough fresh water resources required or needed for these sectors. 
We do have in Abu Dhabi Emirate only or namely three resources or three taps. The first one is the groundwater, which contributes by about 63% out of the total water balance for the Emirate. And then the desalinated water, which is contributing by about 30%, and the remaining, which is about 7%, comes from the reuse of treated or recycled wastewater. Unfortunately, we do have only two aquifer system. One is shallow and the second is the deep aquifer system. The shallow aquifer system consists of two sub aquifers. One, we consolidated aquifer system and the other is the sandy dune aquifer system. Most of the water utilized in Abu Dhabi Emirate is or 99% comes from this shallow aquifer system. The shallow aquifer system is mostly non-renewable aquifer system, except very limited recharge coming as a boundary flux from the, our border with Sultanate of Oman from Al Hagar Mountain. All the areas, all the remaining areas is non-renewable. We don't have any recharge for this area. We don't have rainfall. We don't have uh, surface uh, uh, permanent uh, uh, water bodies like rivers or uh, 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 freshwater lakes. So we are suffering from the limited and scarce water resources. And there is both a lot of challenges for the government to manage its scarce water resources. Unfortunately, during the last 20 years, 100,000 wells have been drilled. 100,000 have been drilled to be used for agriculture, for amenity plantation, for forestry, or forested areas. This, this has been distributed all over the Emirates. And with uh, 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 most of these farms or most of these wells are used in the agriculture sector, in the farming sectors. We do have in Abu Dhabi Emirate about 25,000 farms. Each farm is more than two hectares, about 2.5 hectares. This is the normal size or the average size of the, uh, uh, each farm. And they are bumping about 2.1 billion cubic meter of aquifer, uh, from the aquifer system. However, the aquifer system is recharged maximum between uh, ranges between 90 to 150 million uh, cubic meter year only. So the recharge is less than 5% out of the total abstraction or the abstraction is 20 folds the natural recharge to the aquifer system. So every drop we are losing or using it means that it will never come back again to the aquifer system. We are, total, or we are ultimately losing it. So we have to use it very carefully and we have to manage it very professionally and very sustainably. We, uh, only about 70% of these wells are working. We do have also about 400 or more than 450 forests or a forested area that it's, uh, uh, it, it makes uh, or it's used as a natural habitat for wildlife animals and the birds. And also it protects uh, money of the infrastructure from the sand encroachments like main roads or the settlements area. In this 450 forests, we do have more than 600 wells, 6,000 6, wells. Abstracts a lot of groundwater for the irrigation of this uh, forested area. Also in the amenity plantation, in the recreational areas, we do have more than 400 recreational areas, national parks and gardens all over the country. They are using both treated wastewater and sometimes desalinated water and also groundwater. But still groundwater is used also for the amenity plantation and recreational areas. Out of the total groundwater use about 95% used for agriculture and the forestry sector and the remaining, which is about 5%, used for the amenity plantation landscaping. We don't use any more groundwater for the domestic sector because of the deterioration of the groundwater quality, which is not in compliance with the Abu Dhabi groundwater uh, uh, drinking water standard. The groundwater use have been little bit after starting to regulate it in 2005, to be uh, a drop little bit. And we do, uh, in 2004, the total groundwater use was about 2.7 billion cubic meter a year. Recently, in 29, we, uh, or the last statistic which we did in 2009, we find that we are now reaching only about 2.17. This means that we already saved about 0.5. In 2005, this is a, was the milestone in the groundwater regulation in Abu Dhabi. We started to draft the first emirate law to manage our groundwater resources. And in March 2006, the law number six had been issued by His Highness Sheikh Khalifa as a ruler for Abu Dhabi Emirates. And this was the first emirate law to regulate the groundwater resources in the emirate. 
Unfortunately, because of the deterioration of the groundwater, we have a lot of environmental and economical impact, including the soil salinization of our uh, 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 land, which we are using for agriculture, the accumulation of the salts in the dripping and the irrigation system, which uh, makes a lot of problem for the government because this, most of this infrastructure is heavily subsidized by the government. So the government spend a lot uh, for, for replacing only groundwater uh, 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 by uh, in every year something like 700 million dirham, and the other infrastructure is more than 2 billion dirham for renewing of and, uh, all the infrastructure for irrigation within these farms and subsidize the farm. This also brought a lot of uh, uh, problems for the government and challenge for the government. The second source which we do have in the Emirate is the desalinated water. Since, uh, since we started the desalination processes in Abu Dhabi Emirate in the mid of 60s, we started to increase our capacity. I remember that the first Emirate desalination plants recorded in all the textbook was in 1965, and it was with the capacity of 5,000 uh, gallon a day. Now we do have a capacity of more than 1 billion gallon a day. 1 billion gallon a day. We are producing in Abu Dhabi Emirates alone about 1 billion cubic meter of desalinated water a year. And we are, as the United Arab Emirates, is the second country producing the desalinated water after Saudi Arabia. We are producing around 1.8 billion cubic meter of desalinated water a year. In Abu Dhabi Emirates, we do have about, we do have five big desalination plants. The first one in Kitfan and Fujairah. And this is the first emirate, uh, 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 what is called transboundary emirate uh, uh, desalination plants. And we do have in Abu Dhabi Emirates uh, itself on the Arabian Gulf Coast. Another five, uh, say, uh, four big desalination plants, namely Umm Tawila, Umm Tawila, Umm Nar, Al Shuayhat, and Al Mirfa. And now, as I mentioned, we are producing more than one billion cubic meter of desalination every year. The desalination water is used mainly for domestic. About 50% used for domestic, but however, we still are using some for agriculture at present. About 5%. Uh, is used for agriculture sector, which is sometimes it looks it's not visible to use them for agricultural production, especially when we are using traditional methods for irrigation. Even dripping irrigation or sprinkler irrigation, we are still wasting some uh, very costly resource and very fresh water resources. In the domestic sector, we are the highest per capita all over the world, the highest per capita water use. In Abu Dhabi Emirate, our calculation indicated that the per capita water use is 550 liter a day, which is something like double or treble the worldwide standards. This means that we are wasting our desalinated water. We are using a lot. But this is because of the main reasons that we are using half of this quantity Outdoor use, for outdoor use, for landscaping, for gardening, for backyard irrigation, for swimming pools, and the indoor is about 50% of the total. But this is also put a lot of pressure on the government and the challenges to, sub, to, 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 to provide the domestic sector with these freshwater resources. The second, this is, and, and unfortunately, the demand in the domestic sector increased year after year. And our expectation, our calculation indicated that it will be, we, in, by 2030, we will need be, between 2.5 to 3 times of the total production a day. This means that our capacity should be increased to 2.5 billion cubic meter a year. One cubic meter costing Abu Dhabi Emirate, according to the regulation supervision recent report, about 10 uh, 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 AED, which is Abu Dhabi Emirate or United Arab Emirates uh, Dirham. This means about $2.5 per cubic meter. However, only we are paying 40% of this cost, and 60% is subsidized by the government. So the, this sector is heavily subsidized by the government. So a lot of action needed to manage our demand in this sector. Also, we do have environmental impact. Desalination sector uses uh, uh, about 30 to 40% out of the total uh, energy which we are using. And each cubic meter we are producing from the desalination plants, we are discharging against it two cubic meter of brine water to our gulf. Two cubic meter of brine with a salinity of more than 70,000 BBM with a temperature plus five centigrade, more than the ambient 
ground uh, marine water in the Gulf itself, which have a lot of impact at least at the local areas around the desalination plants. The third source which we are using now is the treated wastewater. Abu Dhabi Emirates have more than 32 treatment plants dis uh, distributed all over the Emirates. We have only four big uh, treatment plants which is, are producing about 90%, two of them in Al Ain city and two in Abu Dhabi city. The two in Al Ain is Al Hama and Al Saad and the two in Abu Dhabi city is Al Wasbaun and Al Wasbatu and still Al Mafraq is uh, uh, operated. Out of the two big uh, treatment plants in Abu Dhabi Emirate, uh, we are producing more than 600 uh, 1,000 cubic meters a day, but only half of this quantity is reused or utilized and recycled. And the half of this quantity is discharged to the environment, and mainly to a South al musaffah channel. And this South al musaffah channel is very narrow area. The water is stagnant, and with this, this heavy load of discharge of treated wastewater cause a lot of environmental impacts, mainly harmful algae blooms, and also the increasing the nutrients within the water in this area, which makes a lot of problems for us. And we need now, the government now have a plan by 2017 to stop all the discharge to environment. And this, we, are, we will reach zero discharge and 100% utilizing our tertiary treated with water because all the treatment plants in Abu Dhabi Emirates is up to a tertiary level, which is a very good quality, which can be used for different sector, including agriculture, amenity, forests, and even for the domestic or the district cooling. So what, we, what is the challenge and the threats is that facing the water sector in Abu Dhabi Emirates? Actually, we do have a lot of stress. The first is the physical like aridity. We are an arid region. We will never able to change the situation. We don't have rainfall. We don't have surface water bodies, fresh surface water bodies. We, are, we have a lot of demand increasing year every year. We have also what we call it institutional and legal fragmentation. There is some duplication in the responsibilities given to some agencies. We have only one law, which is law number six for regulating groundwater. There is some gaps in some areas for managing our resources, and we do need a lot of efforts. However, in 2010, there is a committee, we call it Higher Committee for Water Agriculture, have been formed by His Highness the Crown Prince as a chairman for the Executive Council of Abu Dhabi Emirates, but still more efforts is needed in the water sector to, uh, for more institutional reform and for more legal reform. Also, we do have some external threats. We do have a shared aquifer system, which we don't have a lot of information on it. We have a climate change impact. We do have, we are sharing our neighboring countries in the same resources, which is the uh, 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 Arabian Gulf. Arabian Gulf is very shallow, and the circulation of the water is very slow, and the, 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 the salinity of the Gulf increasing year every year, and we have a lot of pollution load for the Gulf, which dramatically will impact the performance and the efficiency of the desalination in the future and, of course, the cost. Also, we do have internal threats. Our rapid growth in the population. Last year, statistics indicating that we have about 3% 3, 3 increase in the population every year. And we do have also increasing in the agriculture sector. We are extending our forestry sector. We have a, a rapid growth in the industrial sector. All this rapid growth and in the different development and economic sectors, put a lot of pressure on our scarce water resources and need more efforts and more investment from the government in the water sector. We do have the climate change impact, which could have a lot of impacts on the, our scarce water resource. Climate change impacts, and I will not go a lot of details in this issue because it needs a lot of studies, but at least that what we know, that there will be impact on the rainfall and rainfall event and intensity, which will impact also our the limited recharge to the aquifer system. Increasing the temperature will have an impact on the demand in the future, especially in the agriculture, forest land, and recreational sector. And the problem also of the seawater rise will have some impact both on the intakes of the desalination plants on the coast and in the same time on the seawater intrusion, which will dramatically affect the coastal aquifer zones in the future. All these potential impacts will have a lot of uh, importance. But, and this is very fortunately, there is a lot of attention and raises from the decision maker in the country regarding the water issue. 
and we have a lot of political support for the water sector. Uh, in 2010, there is the GCC, the, the 31 uh, uh, GCC summit held in Abu Dhabi, and the main announcement was about water resources. And this is very high level political support for managing the resources, not only in Abu Dhabi or United Arab Emirates, but on all GCC countries. And based on this announcement, we started now to work with all our neighboring countries and our stakeholders to develop the high level strategy for managing the resources in GCC. And we do have now a one unique uh, 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 initiative to have one GCC water grid also. Also in 2011, his Highness the Crown Prince, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, in one of his maglis, and I did attend this maglis myself, he said to all participants, water is more than, or more valuable for us more than oil. It was a very clear quote for His Highness Sheikh Mohammed. We have to interact now, we have to take in, uh, actions now to manage our scarce water resources. And I remember that he said to us, we do have money now, we do have oil now to desalinate water. What's about our next generation after 50 years where we will have no oil, we will have no money? And this very, 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 very hard question to ask as a scientist and a planner. We do have money now to desalinate, we do have money now to spend more money to investment in the water sector. What we will have in after 12, 50 years from now? What will our generation facing in this country in the future? And this put a lot of uh, uh, challenges for the, de for the developers and the government body to make more efforts for managing these scarce water resources. The government started to develop a lot of, or take a lot of action since 2005. The first Emirate Abu Dhabi Water Master Plan was in 2009. And there was a team from different stakeholders and also some experts from international organization working with us to develop the first Emirate Abu Dhabi master plan in 2009. In 2010, we did the first climate change, not only on water impacts study or assessment study, not only in climate change, uh, on, in water resources sector, but on all different sectors. Also, the UAE water master uh, or water conservation strategy have been published in 2010. And we already uh, uh, published or uh, developed a strategy for recycling water or reuse of recycled water in 2011. The problem in Abu Dhabi Emirates is that unfortunately most of the plans which have been developed for the last 20 years was supplied based management plans. We are focusing on increasing water resources. Whenever we have a problem or a severe shortage in any sector, the, so the very easy solution is Spend more money, find another resource of water, or increase the capacity of these desalination plants, drill more wells, spend more money to find a solution. But this is not always a solution. Supply demand management is not always a solution. It causes a lot of problems. It needs always money. But however, we have to do it. We have to make some efforts to implement new desalination plants, to drill new wells, but not always a solution. We have to go to what we call the demand side management. We have to minimize our demand. We have to find new technologies to improve our water use, to improve the efficiency of water. Or sometimes what we call it increase or increase the uh, production of each drop of water. But always in the, in the groundwater uh, uh, supply, and I will go and rush in this to minimize the time, we did a lot of effort in 2005. I remember in 2005, we have been asked by the Executive Council or the Abu Dhabi Emirate to start establishing the first Emirate Water Department and all the mandates, because before that time, there was a fragmentation. I remember that we make some inventory and we find that there is a fragmentation, the responsibility given to more than 20 departments. The municipalities, the one. One minute, okay, I will go. And we did a lot of effort. We did a monitoring network to monitor our groundwater and the change in water level and the quality. And two, because whatever you cannot measure, you will never able to manage. So we started a lot of effort to manage our groundwater resources by, me by measuring them. We started to make the law number six to regulate the groundwater use. We started to have the first emirate database, central database to, our, our, to, to populate all the information. And we collect the information from different institutions and the agencies. And in very central base. This central even database now have been 
joined or linked with a supply demand management decision support system that can allow to know, to expect and predict what will happen in the future after 20 years with any management plan for increasing any development sector. So we can know exactly what we have and what we need and how we can fill the gap between what we have and what we need. This even, uh, we started now to investment more in studying and assessing using renewable energy. And we have one of the very important initiatives with Mazdar now and other stakeholders to assess the using of solar and renewable energy in desalination. And we have an instruction from the government by 2017 to start building the first emirate and the biggest all over the world solar power desalination plants in the world. We started to have some recharging for our aquifer system from the excess desalinated water to recharge the aquifer as a strategic reserve. On the demand side, we started to use non, uh, some new technologies for minimizing the water in the agriculture sector. We started to develop now and build the first emirate uh, protected center to learn, and this is the dissemination and the education center that will help us to uh, uh, to help us to learn and educate the end users, the farmers and the farm user, uh, owners, how they can use new technology for producing more crops per each drop. And we started now this launch. We, and we launched a program in 2009 to start to use water saving devices and water saving technology. And we developed the first emirate code, plumbing code, to avoid using when you wasting uh, plumbing in the future. We started also for minimizing the water use in the landscaping and the amenity plantation in the traditional area. We changed it from green landscaping to hard and desert landscaping. We are using now native species, which is soil tolerant species, drought tolerant species. And we minimize the use per square meter in the amenity plantation from 20 liter per square meter to less than three liter per square meter recently, which is a good achievement for the government. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Daoud, for providing a great overview and a perspective um, of this water challenge here in Abu Dhabi. Our next speaker is Dr. Arya Amir Bahman. Dr. Amir Bahman is a professor of environmental engineering and a cooperating professor in the School of Policy and International Affairs and the Department of Chemistry at the University of Maine. Prior to coming to Maine, <clears throat> excuse me, in 1997, he was a postdoctoral researcher at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. Dr. Amir Bauman's research interests are in uh, biogeochemistry of metals and nutrients in natural and engineered water systems. In particular, he has studied the fate and transport of mercury, arsenic, iron, manganese, phosphorus, and dissolved organic matter in the environment. His recent research has included detection and remediation of mercury in wetlands and coastal sediments and internal phosphorus cycling in lakes. He is also developing photocatalysts to augment the photolysis of some organic contaminants. Dr. Amir Bahman teaches courses in water chemistry, pollutant fate and transport, water treatment, and fluid mechanics. He's a registered professional engineer and also has served as a consultant to private environmental consulting companies and federal and state agencies. And this morning he will be um, presenting his work on protecting water resources in a changing climate, engineering solutions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kim, for that introduction. Uh, I would like to thank His Excellency, Dr. Jamal, and the staff of EC, uh, the Emirates uh, Strategic Center for Strategic Research Studies, uh, for extending their invitation uh, to us to visit this beautiful country <clears throat> and uh, present uh, some of our thinking uh, about this important issue of climate change. Uh, the topic of my talk is protecting drinking water resources in a changing climate. Specifically, I'll be talking about engineering solutions. Uh, there's a wide variety of 
water quality issues uh, that one has to deal with, especially in the face of climate change. Uh, given the time constra constraints, uh, I will be talking about drinking water uh, in Maine, of course, and some of the engineering solutions that we're proposing uh, to address the issues of climate change. Water quantity versus quality. Uh, the study of climate change and even the news that uh, climate change uh, receives largely focus on effects on water quantity as opposed to water quality. Specifically, water availability, management, and safety, uh, especially against flooding. Effects on quality of fresh surface waters. Some people call fresh waters sweet water as opposed to salt water from the ocean. Effects on quality of fresh surface waters and shallow groundwaters are often neglected at the expense of uh, water quantity. The example of that, for example, is the, <clears throat> I can use the, uh, effect of sea level rise and storm intensity on flooding and erosion of coastal areas as opposed to saltwater intrusion in coastal aquifer, aquifers. Uh, the physical effects uh, that storms uh, and sea level rise uh, brings about coastal areas uh, are covered a lot more than say saltwater intrusion as Dr. Dawood in the case of uh, the UAE uh, mentioned. Climate change can impact freshwater quality in three different ways, three different general ways. One is that higher temperatures lead to longer and warmer summers. Uh, this is, I don't think, okay. um, anyway, this is uh, a plot uh, you can see at the bottom, there's years going back to 1800s, uh, on the vertical axis, uh, we have the dates. Uh, these are the uh, dates on loss of ice cover in Maine lakes. Lakes in Maine, lakes in most of North America, uh, especially the northern latitudes, form thick layers of ice uh, during the winter. This ice persists through, uh, depending on if you were back in 1800s, uh, the ice went out of these lakes late April, early May. That time has shifted earlier and early, earlier to the extent that we have what we call ice out in early to middle of April. The result of this, without getting into too much mechanisms and technicalities, is that higher turbidity and more waterborne organisms, for example, microbes, algae, etc. The second effect is changes in storm intensity, duration, and timing increase the risk of droughts or floods. The result of that would be drastic changes in particulate, organic carbon, and nutrient loading. Also, uh, strong uh, storm events uh, bring about frequent lake mixing that, have, that has um, adverse effects on the quality of water. Uh, in this plot that you see, this, this plot basically, those uh, blue dots show a flood. Along with this flood, um, yeah, this really doesn't work. Uh, along with this flood, uh, on this right part axis, uh, you see mobilization of color uh, in these streams. Now, color is a proxy, itself is a contaminant, but it's also a proxy for many other contaminants. What we see, as these floods get more and more frequent, we see more pollution being mobilized into these rivers and they end up in the lakes. The third effect is that of sea level rise and lower flows in rivers that increase the salinity of coastal rivers and estuaries, as Dr. Daoud mentioned. Uh, the map here, this is a NOAA map that shows all eastern and southern uh, coastal uh, U.S. Uh, have experienced uh, relative sea level rise uh, from 1960 to 2013. Some of these increases are fairly 
uh, drastic. These are in inches. The result would be saltwater intrusion and groundwater and coastal wetlands. For example, there are examples in uh, Florida and Netherlands where they have uh, studied this issue fairly extensively. This schematic uh, shows uh, how climate change can affect water quality. I will be talking about water quality in lakes in Maine. We have well over 5,000 lakes in Maine, many of which are used as drinking water sources. Climatic changes manifest themselves in temperature, variations in temperature and uh, precipitation. Temperature and precipitation can affect the lake directly uh, through droughts or floods, or they can affect the watersheds. Watersheds could be natural, such as forested watersheds, such as desert watershed, or they can be built environments. And I've lumped urban and agriculture into build envir built environments. Changes in temperature, or drastic changes in temperature, increases in temperature, and also precipitation can bring about uh, excessive runoff, sewage overflow from these watersheds into the lakes. Contaminants in the lakes are generally divided into four classes. Dissolved organic carbon is one. That's color. That's simply the material that imparts color. On its own, it's not toxic. However, it can carry toxic compounds. It can also put undue stress on water treatment systems. Then there's the issue of nutrients. Phosphorus and nitrogen. Phosphorus is a major issue in inland waters, in fresh waters, in sweet waters. Then we have a class of contaminants called emerging contaminants and micropollutants. In the US, uh, the EPA has, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency in the US, has measured uh, thousands of trace pharmaceutical compounds. This can be anything from the Tylenol that people take to relieve pain, to birth control medication, to sunscreen, material in the sunscreen that people put on their you know, bodies to go out. And these end up in water systems. There are also algal toxins. There are uh, you know, algae that are growing, and we see more and more of them in the US, in, in lakes in Maine, where <clears throat> these lakes experience blooms of algal to toxic algae, blue green algae and of course trace metals. Then we have pathogens. Pathogens are disease-causing organisms. Now, these pollutants, one way or the other, get into the water treatment facilities, and I'll be talking about that. The dissolved organic carbon can, after it's chlorinated, every water treatment plant in the world almost, adds chlorine or some compound of chlorine to its water at the very end. If chlorine is added to excessive dissolved organic carbon, it can end up producing disinfection byproducts, many of which are carcinogenic. They cause cancer. There's also emerging contaminants uh, and pathogens, many of which uh, escape through these water systems and end up uh, threatening uh, people's health. Uh, most of you might have heard two months ago, um, uh, Lake Erie in northern part of the U.S., city of Toledo of 400,000 people were advised not to touch their water for two and a half days. What happens was the nexus of high temperatures and excess or excessive phosphorus runoff from the agriculture into the lakes. The lakes started blooming with toxic algae. These toxic algae secreted toxins that ended up in water treatment systems. The water treatment systems, many of which are not very resilient, um, uh, could not handle this. As a result, 400,000 people were advised not to touch water for two days. There's a challenge facing water treatment plants. Each water treatment plant is custom designed to handle a certain type of source water. Depending on the type of water, the quality of water that a treatment plant receives, treatment will be different. I have studied many water treatment plants uh, during my career. Uh, not two of them were the same. They use one way or the other different processes. A rapidly changing source water quality may make even modern water plants, modern water treatment plants, obsolete. 
Again, most of these plants are not very resilient, especially in the face of these emerging contaminants. Most conventional plants cannot effectively, tr effectively treat emerging contaminants. The investment needs, according to the US EPA, for the next 20 years is fairly great. $384 billion for providing safe drinking water uh, to people. State of Maine, where we come from, has something like uh, 1.2 million uh, population, and it alone requires $60 million a year of investment to upgrade and make sure that our water treatment plants are operating safely, unfortunately, Less than half of this amount is spent. Now, here's a schematic of a water treatment plant. These are very different than desalination plants. These are plants that take out fresh water. This is called a filtration plant. Basically, what you see, there's a lake on the corner there. Water is pumped into an intake. Water goes through a set of what we call physical and chemical processes. It's energy intensive, nothing like desalination. It's still energy intensive and highly chemical intensive. There's a set of physical chemical processes. Water goes through a lot of chemicals are added to it to remove the particulate matter. The particulate matter could be the microbes, could be silt and clay that end up in these plants. Lastly, it's disinfected and put in the distribution system. Providing clean water to people requires three components. One is that the source water, in this case the lake or reservoir or river, should be protected. Many lakes in Maine belong to the water authority. People are not, are not allowed to swim in them. Uh, boating on them is, is fairly restricted. So source water protection is one. Effective engineering design of water treatment plant is another and of course the distribution system. At the University of Maine we have active research going on on source water protection as well as effective water treatment. Now here's the issue in Maine. Uh, historically Maine waters have been very clean especially with respect to particulate matter. Water has been pumped in. This is true with the three largest water treatment plants in Maine. Water is pumped right out of the lake, the processes to remove particulate matter are bypassed, water is directly disinfected via UV light, ozone, uh, or ozone and ozone sometimes, and definitely chlorinated at the end and put into the water distribution system. Now, this is becoming a problem for Maine because the source water is changing in quality. The correct approach in this case would be Sustainable watershed management in the face of a changing climate and land use. An example of this would be green infrastructure, infrastructures. These are water management systems that use natural systems for better water quality and less runoff, such as uh, creating wetlands, uh, green buffers to remove the particulate matter, to remove the nutrients before the water enters a larger body, such as a lake. Secondly, we do need to have resilient and adaptable water treatment systems with respect to a changing climate that uh, is, is you know, very fast changing the source water quality. State of Maine and large parts of North America face a major challenge in this respect. And that is, in many water systems, even if the input of contaminants is completely seized, is completely stopped today, for example, via land use changes or stricter government regulations, it will take decades for water quality to improve. This is especially true with phosphor phosphorus, which is what we call the limiting nutrient in freshwater systems, mercury, which is highly toxic, and many organic contaminants that can actually make people very sick. Immediate solutions are needed as human health may be at risk. Green solutions are excellent, except that they take time to uh, make, make, make a serious influence on the quality of water. We do need immediate solutions in this respect. Um, I'd like to talk about lake water quality. Uh, the question of eutrophication. Eutrophication would be the um, uh, growth of algae uh, and loss of water quality in lakes, and it's closely related to phosphorus. In most inland waters, 
excess phosphorus causes loss of water quality due to algal growth. Sediments in most main lakes, and this is our problem, contain sufficient phosphorus to maintain many years of eutrophication and poor water quality, even if the watershed contributes none. What I talked about, these systems are so already loaded, naturally most of them, with, this, with phosphorus that even if uh, things change in terms of laws, uh, it, it, may not solve, it may not solve our problems. Warming of surface, surface waters and extreme storms enhance sediment phosphorus release and consequent eutrophication. A case study is Lake Auburn in Maine. Uh, you see the map of the US in the corner there. Uh, those six states that you see are called New England. Maine, of course, is the upper one. Um, and uh, Lake Auburn, this is something like close to 600 hectares in surface area, it's not very large, uh, is shown in with a red star there. It's, it's a beautiful setting. Um, it's a pr primary drinking water source for 50,000 people. Historically, as I mentioned, it's been very clean. Minimum treatment was required with respect to removal of particulate matter, so no filtration, only UV, ultraviolet light, and chlorine disinfection were used. However, in recent years, warming water caused algal blooms, fish kills, taste and odor problems. So the plant has to deal with this. They're not equipped to do so. The problem starts with the depletion of oxygen from the lake bottom. Uh, this map shows that in recent years, the lake in the summer has been losing oxygen. In a nutshell, this is how it works. High temperatures lead to low oxygen in the lake. Low oxygen leads to phosphorus release. Phosphorus release leads to turbidity. Not surprisingly, uh, turbidity has increased in the past few years and the treatment plan is in trouble. Um, conditions for phosphorus release, uh, let me just skip this given the time constraints, I'm sorry. Uh, what we are uh, proposing basically is to add aluminum to this lake as an engineering solution. It's really the aluminum iron ratio that we've found through years of research at the University of Maine uh, that controls how much phosphorus can be released. Um, let me quickly go through this. These we have a graduate student on the left, a, a very brilliant high school student on the right, helping us sampling the deep sediment in the lake. Uh, and what we see is basically, uh, as I mentioned, we're proposing to add non-toxic aluminum in solid form, targeted addition of which can effectively keep phosphorus in the sediment and prevents its uh, release. Um, there is a threshold aluminum to iron ratio of 3, point, uh, 3 to 1 that we need to have, and this lake, uh, the contour line, that's the area of the lake that's most prone to phosphorus release, shows that actually this lake is very sufficient. So what we're thinking is through targeted addition of aluminum, we can effectively sequester and keep phosphorus in the sediment. We're also uh, doing modifications to the existing UV plant. Uh, and this involves modification, as, as I mentioned, this is the UV system in the water treatment plant. On the diagram on the left, water enters uh, those ultraviolet re reactors. That's inside the ultraviolet reactor where water is exposed uh, uh, to very high uh, power radiation uh, to effectively degrade some organisms. However, UV on its own is not very effective in the face of some of these emerging contaminants that we see as a result of climate change, as a result of warming. Um, we have developed immobilized and magnetic titanium oxide nanoparticles for use inside these UV chambers to augment the, 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 the activity of these UV chambers to degrade these emerging contaminants. Here's a graduate student uh, synthesizing carbon fiber coated titanium photocatalyst and this is an electron micrograph of high surface area titanium nanoparticles. The way they work the UV light hits these particles through a fairly complex chemistry. They produce highly reactive, what we call radicals, oxygen radicals that can indiscriminately attack contaminants 
and as a result, uh, destroying them. What we've found is that these are actually quite effective and we would like to implement this in the water treatment system. Let me quickly go to the conclusions. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just running through with this talk. Uh, water quality and quantity should be considered integrated together. Water has to be both plentiful and clean. Effects of climate change should be considered in conjunction, conjunction with those of land use. These effects are at times synergistic. Long-term sustainable water management solutions are required. However, threat to human health requires immediate intervention at various levels. What I tried to show is that we are doing remediation both at the source water scale and engineering design, changes in the engineering design at uh, the treatment scale. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed Bauman, um, for pre presenting an excellent presentation, an overview of the water challenges in Maine, um, which is in contrast to the water challenges here in Abu Dhabi. Our next speaker is Mr. Thomas Parrish. Mr. Parrish is the Vice President of iSciences LLC, a scientific and technical consulting firm. In his role as Director of Sustainability Programs, Mr. Parrish advises large companies, non-governmental -gover organizations, and U.S. government clients on global environmental issues, inclu including climate change and water stress. Mr. Paris is trained in mathematics, computer science, and public policy. He holds degrees from the University of Michigan and Harvard University. He also served as an advisor to the University of Maine's Sustainability Solutions Initi Initiative. This morning, he'll be talking to us about preparing for long-term changes in water stress. Thank you, Dr. Kim, and thank you all. It's a true honor and a privilege to be able to speak to you about uh, climate and water today. I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Um, my talk is a bit in contrast. Rather than talking about specific places, Maine and, and, uh, and the United Arab Emirates, my talk is about looking at water stress from a global perspective. Um, and with apologies to the prior speaker, this is mostly about quantity but I absolutely agree that quality is equally important and often is underrepresented in these sorts of discussions. So I'll talk about five things today. The first point, which has a US-centric uh, piece, is about the really rapidly emerging concerns about water sustainability. Uh, and while my examples are from the United States, uh, this is really a, truly a global phenomenon that's really uh, been impressive in the scale and growth over the last 10 years. Then I'll talk a little bit about some analytic frameworks that you can use to approach the issue and, uh, and then show you some maps where we measure and map water risks on a global scale uh, and talk about some of the things that we can do as we prepare for, for our future. And, uh, and I have a parting thought that I'll keep as a surprise. So, from a corporate perspective, we've seen an incredible growth in concern about corporate sustainability when it comes to water. Uh, there was recently a survey of 50 large US-based corporations that showed, that asked about the degree to which water impacts their business and how they're planning to respond to those water challenges. And what's really very surprising is the growth and the rapid growth in the concern from fairly low levels, minorities of the 50 co corporations through 2013 to majorities in 20, thinking that water risk in 2018 will significantly affect business growth, profitability, where they can locate their facilities, and their ability to market products. Um, that's really a, a, a tremendous transformation in corporate culture when it comes to thinking about environmental risk. But it's not just companies. Governments are also increasingly concerned 
and many are securitizing the issue of water. This is an example from the United States, but I could have equally have drawn many examples from around the world where water is now prominently a national security issue. And one of the challenges that we face as scientists when it comes to studying global water issues is the fact that it's become a national security issue. It's become very difficult to get quality data on water from around the world. So now I'm transitioning. I'm going to talk a little bit about analytic frameworks. When it comes to thinking about water, I think there are three main axes that define the types of analysis that you want to do. The first is the decision context. Are you talking about strategic planning about water? Or are you talking about tactical responses to specific water issues? Um, Long-term competitive position, risk change management, partnerships, adaptation, resilience, these are strategic issues. But when you get down to specific places, you need near-term, place-based issues and you get into the engineering of how to design, what to build, whether to abandon pre-existing facilities or engage in a public policy debate, retreat from a public policy debate, or, or pretend it doesn't exist and hide from it. Similarly, there's a spatial extent that matters. Many organizations have global portfolios. Um, large companies, sovereign investment funds, they need a me mechanisms to compare water risk throughout their portfolio so they can spot, cue, and prioritize the types of investments they want to make to mitigate those risks or take advantage of opportunities. At the local scale, you, you get into questions about siting, designing, building, and operating specific types of facilities or enterprises. Water also operates at many different time scales, from what I call the chronic, meaning the, the, sort of the expected condition for a long period of time, to the episodic, the dr floods, the droughts, the water quality crises. And between those are trends uh, that connect the chronic to the episodic. So when I think about uh, environmental stresses, I can't decouple them from a lot of other things that are going on in the world in addition to the environmental stress. So this diagram, uh, which is adapted from the literature, talks about variability and change in human systems on the left, on the top, and variability and change in environmental systems on the bottom. These two sets of changes interact with one another over different time frames to produce stresses to specific places. So it's very different if I'm performing irrigated agriculture and have a heavy water use as a result of that, or whether I'm trying to cool a power plant. And so the way that the, the place is organized and the way the human system interacts with the environmental system changes the types of, of stresses that I'm sensitive to. And then, then, of course, there are ways that a particular place can cope, adapt, be resilient to those stresses. What's missing from this picture is that the place is also sensitive to what's going on in other places to with, with which it has transactional relationships, either through business, imports and exports, or cultural relationships, uh, the Middle East and North Africa region, for example. Um, so the places, water stress in one place can very easily affect water stress in another place. A good example of that is that when Russia banned wheat exports as a result of a drought, that had a tremendous impact on Egypt, which is the traditional source of Egypt's wheat supply. These things combine to produce outcomes. I've only shown the undesirable outcomes here on the right, but you can also have desirable outcomes if you manage properly. And of course, the system is interactive. Uh, what happens in any one piece of this diagram is recursive and affects uh, the other pieces. So now I'm transitioning to show you some work that we've done primarily in partnership with the World Resources Institute on measuring and mapping water risks on a global basis. The World Resources Institute has launched a platform called Aqueduct, which is a global mapping platform with about a dozen indicators of water risk, and our analytics provided half of those uh, 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 indicators. And it allows companies to put in their plant locations and roll up to get a sense of their overall corporate exposure to water risk. I'm going to talk about one of those indicators that we call baseline water stress. And this is purely a quantity indicator, but it's the relationship between the demand for water, total withdrawals, and the renewable supply for water, less the upstream consumptive use. So if I'm downstream from someone who's using a lot of water for irrigated agriculture, that's not part of my renewable supply anymore. Higher values don't necessarily indicate that a particular place is going thirsty, but it does indicate 
uh, increasing socioeconomic competition for access to water. Many more actors are trying to gain value from the same quantity of water. And the very highest values often indicate use or overuse of, of alternative water resources, such as groundwater, interbasin transfers, desalinization, and reuse. And of course, these are much more expensive ways to meet your supply than through renewable uh, sources. That's a chronic condition. With typical climate and typical uh, use patterns, you get the baseline water stress. But the average is a bad thing to manage against because there's a lot of variability in the average. And there are trends in that variability that are important to watch. So this is a picture that was produced by, uh, in a report authored by uh, Professor, Professor McElroy at Harvard University and Dr. James, D. James Baker, who's a former administrator of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, talking about, in part, trends in the prevalence of water anomalies. And this is one example that they showed for the Eastern Mediterranean. And the plot shows the proportion of land area experiencing extreme water deficits or surpluses as a function of time. And what you can see in this region is a series of three escalating periods of extreme drought until we get to the drought of 2007 to 2010, which coincidentally or not, we can talk about causal mechanisms in another discussion, precedes the onset of the Arab Spring. So now we have one example of chronic conditions, one example of trends, and then we want to get a sense of what's going to happen in the future. So we want to project out long-term changes in water stress. To do that, you need scenarios of what's going to happen to supply, though it's climatically driven, uh, and so you need emission scenarios to, and, and general circulation models to do that. But you also need to couple that with projections about demand, and there are now an emerging set of scenarios called so shared socioeconomic pathways that provide a common basis uh, for people to do analysis of, of uh, future socioeconomic development patterns, primarily with, from population, GDP, and urban versus rural populations. When you do that analysis, uh, you can look at the changes in supply. Uh, and there are two depictions here. The, the, the map on the top depicts the absolute difference in, uh, uh, between a typical supply in 2040 and a typical supply as of 2010. And you can also look at it as a relative change and the percentage change. Um, and what you see uh, in different ways on both of those maps is a very well understood uh, physical property of climate that as it warms, you have an expansion of what are called the Hadley cells, which are the semi-arid subtropics uh, in the northern and southern hemispheres. Uh, sorry, it doesn't show very well. But um, that's the yellow areas uh, from going from the southern United States into the Mediterranean, and also uh, in the southern hemisphere from Argentina southern Africa and into Australia, where, where the supply is going to be significantly less, even in just 30 years' time frame, than it is today. It's not a global situation, but it is uh, uh, regionally very important. Then you can also look at changes in total withdrawals. And again, this is a projection with absolute changes on top and a relative change on the bottom, the ratio of, 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 the, of 2040 versus 2010. And for most regions of the world, supply is projected to increase. Again. Uh, and what you see uh, is that in the same areas where, where, su where supply will decrease, total withdrawals are also projected to increase. And when you put that together to get a sense of change in water stress, what you see on the top is the projected water stress in 2040. Um, that looks very similar, if you remember, the earlier map uh, of 2010. But the reason is that the areas that are already under stress are going to become more stressed in the future, both due to declining supply and because those are the areas with, with, the, with increasing demand as well. So what can we do about it? Well, you can manage supply, you can manage demand. I put demand on top for the very reasons that our prior speaker talked about. There's increasing supply is very expensive and there are diminishing points of return. So what can we do to reduce demand? We can increase irrigation efficiency, reduce unproductive evaporation. Agriculture accounts for 70% of global withdrawals, and depending on how you, what source you use, 80 to 90% of consumptive use. Um, still focusing on agriculture, reducing food waste would have a tremendous uh, 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 
value in terms of reducing the water embedded in that food waste required to grow the food. Similarly, changing food preferences. I speak to you as a carnivore, but if I became a, a, veg a vegetarian, my water footprint, my personal water footprint, would decline dramatically. Um, we can increase domestic and industrial water use efficiency, and that's important in certain regions, but agriculture on a global scale is really where the action is. And then, of course, there's water reuse schemes. Most water systems around the world use water once, and, it, and, and, it's, and the result is treated as wastewater. And our prior speakers have talked about the need to reuse water, which has a very heavy engineering component to bring it back up to standards where it can be used for specific applications. It also has a regional planning component because the producers and consumers of wastewater are typically different actors, and so you need to connect them from a regional perspective. Increasing supply is expensive, but there are mechanisms that in certain regions work. Rainwater harvesting, primarily used for groundwater recharge, increasing storage to produce for adaptability to interannual variability, interbasin transfer so that you can move water from relatively water-rich regions to water-stressed regions, and desalinization. The, the challenge is those are extremely expensive. The geographies to which they apply are limited, and you hit the points of diminishing returns very quickly. And finally, my surprise parting thought. Please don't view this slide as an endorsement of either the paper or the company, but there are incredible, there's incredible imagination that's going to be required to think about how to reconfigure the way we use water. On the left, they talk about irrigated afforestation of the Sahara and the Australian outback to produce carbon sinks to remove carbon from the atmosphere. Prob it isn't clear to me whether that will work or not if you do the uh, actual accounting, but this paper claims that it will work. Similarly, on the right, you have companies emerging that are trying to take advantage of greenhouse technology, solar energy, and afforestation uh, to produce um, more... Uh, they, they use the greenhouse technology for desalinization, for desalination coupled with the solar power. They grow food in the greenhouses and they produce uh, 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 fresh water that can then be used to support forestry in the surrounding area. Uh, so, again, I'm not convinced these ideas will work, but they're indicative of the type of imagination and creativity that's going to be required to transform our current growth patterns into something more sustainable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Parrish. Now we will take a few minutes for discussion and recommendations and taking questions. I think we have a little bit of time here for some questions for our speakers. And um, I'd like to thank all the speakers um, for the three excellent talks, presenting a range of concerns around water from um, challenges in quantity and quality and from local to global. So with that, if there are any questions for our three speakers. Thank you. Uh, questions to uh, Dr. Daoud, please. Uh, you mentioned a lot of initiatives in, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, uh, my question is, what can, what can be done more than to what you have mentioned already? And this might be a recommendation from this conference to, to, to do something more, if you like. Thank you. Uh, actually, the government of Abu Dhabi doing a lot of efforts, especially recently, since started uh, to appoint or to uh, structure the water sector in 2005. We are looking to many different angles uh, uh, regarding the water resources management with the Emirates, including supply management, demand side management, and also uh, the legal and institutional uh, reform. Uh, for the supply uh, management, we started, as I mentioned, the first Emirates uh, initiative to use renewable energy. And we have now uh, an initiative started with Mazar uh, last year and we started now to uh, spend some money and to uh, uh, assess different technologies and renewable, uh, using renewable energy, like forward osmosis and ceramic membranes. 
for desalination, which means that we will uh, uh, decrease the cost and also we will decrease the environmental impact or minimize the environmental impact in the future. On the other hand, now there is a lot of efforts to fully utilize and there is a plan now by the government that we will be, by 2017, will have a zero discharge to the environment from the treated wastewater. We are treating our uh, wastewater to up to a tertiary level and we are working now to reuse them not only in the forestry or uh, in landscaping but also in the farms for food production, especially for food production, I can say. So there is a lot of efforts. The, actually, there is a lot of improvements and achievements uh, in, the f uh, in the field of uh, institutional uh, reform and also in the uh, legal reform. So there is many issues, but if you are looking for what we can more use, I think the more important issues that we still miss is the awareness. It's still the awareness and the education. Uh, and we have now a lot of efforts. We are working with the students in many uh, uh, schools, even starting from the primary schools and, and even up to the university schools and how we can increase the awareness regarding the wastage of water. Still, our attitude, our culture, we are wasting water, to be fair with you. Uh, and we are wasting also water and food, as mentioned by doctor. And one of the uh, very important issue is to minimize the food uh, wastage. Uh, about 40% of the food waste uh, is wasted, mostly wasted. And the public acceptance of the reuse of treated wastewater. We still have some resistance, especially for the farm owners, to reuse the treated wastewater for food production and in the agriculture sector. We, are, we held many uh, awareness campaigns and workshops with the uh, users to introduce to them how we can use the treated wastewater in the future. So there is a lot of efforts that could be done in the future still. I can say. <clears throat> so, um, this is a question for Dr. Dawood. Uh, thank you for your informative presentation. We all know by now that water scarcity and security. Uh, sorry, I cannot hear sorry. you very well. We all know by now that water security and scarcity is a large scale issue that's difficult to tackle at the local level only. You discussed and presented several threats to water availability locally. You mentioned that the main external threats to water availability in Abu Dhabi is mainly shared aquifers that we don't have much information on. Um, what's the Emirate of Abu Dhabi doing at the local level to neutralize, to neutralize that threat? In other words, are there any programs with neighboring Emirates? Um, what's the UAE doing with, the res with that respect at the GCC level? Thank you. On a GCC level, there is a committee, they call the Eight Water Committee under the GCC Council, uh, exists in Riyadh, with the different members from different countries. And we, through this committee, we, do, we did a lot of uh, uh, efforts in different also angles for water sectors, including, as I mentioned, the development of the high strategy. And Dr. Ahmad Murad is our focal point, and he's here, he can elaborate more on the development of the GCC water strategy. We develop many guidelines and standards for reusing of treated wastewater, for the discharging of treated wastewater. Uh, and we did some still, we are in the, uh, 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 in the beginning of the study for assessing the shared aquifer systems, to assess the groundwater shared aquifer systems uh, uh, in GCC countries. Also, we started uh, to uh, design and uh, assess to implement the first uh, GCC uh, unique grid, water grid. And I remember we started this in 2008-2007 with a, a, a French consultant, uh, but the problem for the governments, for different governments in GCC was the, at that time was the cost is very, uh, very high. The cost at that time was $11 billion, if I remember, and after a lot of review and discussion with the decision maker and the uh, ministers of water in GC countries, we reduced it to $5 billion. But even the participation, the shares of each country, how they can benefit from it, put it in hold. Nowadays, we started to reassess uh, this idea for a unique grid for GCC, and we phased it to two phases. 
uh, we'll call it bilateral, or each two countries could be joined, to, uh, linked together to a unique, uh, one grid. And then in the future, we should, we could have a unique grid for all GCC countries. So there is a lot of initiative between GCC, and there is understand, and as I mentioned, one of the most important issues in GCC is that we started to have a political support from the leaders, top leaders. The president of the countries, uh, uh, His Highness Sultan of Oman, His Highness Sheikh Khalifa, His Highness the ruler of uh, the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi. We do have a lot of political supports on a GCC level to work together as one team. Actually, I have uh, three questions. One for each, but I'll start with the Thomas, maybe if the time will allow, we'll ask at the end, Dr. Mohammed. My question to Professor Thomas that you uh, referred to the Global Water Security Report, yeah. and in that report you had a quote from, a quote from this report that uh, uh, within coming 10 years, some of the country will have a problem in terms of the water quality or even shortages. Or sometimes it refers, I, I, I went through this report actually, I mentioned that some of the country will fail. Do you think that's what happened in the region, in some of the country that related to the failure could be related to water stress in somehow? I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but um, if, you have, if, if, a, if a country is already dealing, or a region is already dealing with very high levels of water stress, and then there's natural variability that makes the water even more scarce than uh, one would normally expect, uh, coupled with a lack of, of um, capacity for, for uh, uh, drawing upon some sort of reserve, whether it be groundwater or a uh, larger allocation from a neighboring country, uh, then, then yes, that becomes a critical issue for the, the people and the government of the country uh, in, because water is so critical to daily life. Um, and, uh, 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 and what that report the Global Water Security Report says is that becomes a distraction for U.S. allies uh, relative to other uh, 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 collaboration that the U.S. is trying to engage with those countries about. I hope that answers your question. Victor Ali, you mentioned, I think, in your presentation, your slides about the uh, remediation by aluminum. What exactly the status of aluminum in remediating the soil? Is it elemental aluminum or what? Uh, it, it's not elementary aluminum. Of course, uh, every, everyone calls, well, the word is aluminum. Only Americans call it aluminum. I don't know where that comes from. But anyway, aluminum or aluminum that's added is in ionic form. When it hits water, it becomes solid. It's not elemental, kind of like what you have in your uh, aluminium pan that you would use for cooking. That's elemental. Um, aluminium in its dissolved form can actually be quite toxic to fish, but uh, it dissolves only under very acid conditions. If this were 30, 40 years ago, I would not necessarily recommend adding aluminium to some of these lakes because lakes were more acidic back then. Uh, but uh, when we study the chemistry of the lakes, uh, most of these lakes actually would be uh, quite conducive to uh, taking aluminum, make it into solid form that would then sequester phosphorus. So they're fairly safe. I want to stress one dilemma here in this, the area here, the Gulf area. Uh, when you look at the uh, water consumption, uh, within the, uh, the global water consumption, uh, here in the country, in the area, you uh, who consume about five to ten times more than in other countries, 
which have water in excess. For example, when you go to Europe, you have 100 liters, less than 100 liters per capita a day. And here, you have a, a, a very high consumption. And uh, are there any concepts here in the country to reduce the consumption? And uh, I want to stress it because uh, in this way that um, water pricing is also different here uh, to other countries. And I have one a positive example how to reduce the water consumption, and this was the unification of Germany. In Eastern Germany, water was for free, and the consumption was about 500 to 600 liters per capita a day. And after the unification, they increased the price to five euro per cubic meter, and now they have less than 80 liters per day. Uh, this is, we are all human beings. If something is for free, you use it and spoil it. This is our problem here. And are there any uh, now ideas? Uh, in the afternoon, you talk about education. This could be one uh, possibility, but I think um, it must harm you, then you save the water. I totally agree with you, Peter. Water tariffs or water price is one of the main tools that we should look at it for saving water in the future. I would like to say that unfortunately three proposals have been submitted to the government recently and the three proposals have been rejected or bottom holes because of many reasons. But we do a lot of efforts and one of our recommendations in the water master plan in 2009 and then lately in uh, our water policy which have been developed or the higher water strategy sometimes we called it, which have been developed in 2013, one of the main recommendations was about the water tariffs. Still, we have a fixed water tariff, very cheap water tariffs. And as I mentioned, 60% or even 70% uh, of our invoice or our bill of water, it's heavily subsidized or sub fully subsidized by the government. We are paying now uh, for each uh, thousand gallon only 10 dirhams. However, it costs us more than 37 dirhams. So 27 is paid by the government and only 10 is paid by us. So I totally agree with you. And we have to look at it in the future. Being mindful of time, I think we'll have to wrap up at this point. But I did want to make a quick announcement that um, tours will be available for, of, of the center for this group. And um, if people are interested to um, please find Ms. Amil Al Masafri, who will be over here um, during the break. So, Thank you, and please join me in thanking all of the, our excellent speakers. <laughs>